In this video, we're going to be thinking about why you can believe in God. Uh, to start, though, I'd like to ask you, those who are listening and watching, uh, just to pause and to ask yourself, what are you expecting this video to be about? What ideas and arguments would a presentation entitled Why You Can Believe in God be likely to cover? What do you think I might be hoping to demonstrate or to prove? The reason I say this is that my assumption is that most of us will assume that why you can believe in God will be about this. Why you can believe in the existence of God. I think when speaking about matters of religion and God and we talk about belief, we all subconsciously insert these three words, the existence of, and expect this topic to concern reasons and evidence to believe in the existence of God. Now, this is a very valid topic. Uh, and if you're interested in learning more about the reasons to believe in the existence of God, and in particular, the God of the Bible, then there are many good presentations on this subject. Uh, in fact, um, as part of a presentation I gave in November last year, um, entitled, It Does Matter What We Believe, I actually explored this question and we considered a brief overview of six different reasons and forms of evidence to have confidence in believing in the existence of the God of the Bible. Uh, and these were uh, creation, uh, the Jews as God's witnesses, uh, archaeological evidence providing proving the Bible to be historically accurate, uh, manuscript evidence uh, providing confidence in the accuracy of the text of the Bible, um, evidence for the resurrection, and the consistent and unified message of the Bible. So if uh, this is the question you were hoping was going to be answered in this presentation. If, it, if the question you're interested in is why you can believe in the existence of God, then I suggest that, that, that this other video might be a good place to start. Uh, and, and I've got the link to the Swansea Christian Facebook page at the bottom of this uh, page. Um, uh, and the, the video was posted on the 5th of November 2020. And the direct YouTube link is also there if anyone's interested. However, given that this topic has already been covered in another video, Instead of repeating myself in this presentation, uh, I thought we would take a slightly different approach. And to do this, I'd like us to think about how we understand what the word believe means. As we've said, when we talk about matters of religion and God, we, we typically assume the word believe means to believe in the existence of something. However, when the same word believe is used in other contexts, this is not necessarily the meaning we assume. So a couple of examples. Um, if we say, I believe in the Prime Minister, or being in Wales, I believe in the First Minister, um, then I'm not saying that I believe in the existence of the Prime Minister or the First Minister. I'm saying that I believe, um, I, I, have, I have trust in them. I have confidence in these individuals. Likewise, if I believe in the manager of the, the Welsh rugby or football team, I'm not saying I believe in their existence, but I have confidence and I have trust in them. To believe can speak of the fact that someone has trust or confidence in someone or something because they consider them to be these things. They, 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 they have that trust, that confidence, because they consider the, the object of their, their belief, their trust, to be trustworthy, to be reliable, to be stable, to be consistent, to be dependable, to be faithful and to be capable that the, the, the person is not fickle or unpredictable or erratic, but they are all these, these have all these qualities. Uh, and the reason I think it's helpful to highlight that actually we can think of belief in this way is because when the Bible speaks about belief and faith, I think it's usually actually referring to this meaning of belief. The Bible does, of course, speak about believing in the existence of God, but I think it's actually more focused on people trusting and having confidence in God. So for this video, it's this concept I'd like to explore. We're going to assume that there is good evidence that the God of the Bible exists. And we are instead going to ask, why can you trust in the God of the Bible? Why is it reasonable to have confidence in the God that is presented to us in the Bible? Because the Bible presents a portrait of God to us. Uh, it records God's dealings with humans over several thousand years. 
And what I'd like to demonstrate is that the Bible provides evidence that God is all of these things on, on the screen here, that he is trustworthy, he is reliable, he is stable, he is consistent, he is dependable, he is faithful and he is capable. So therefore, this is a God we can put our trust and our confidence in. This is a God we can believe in. The Bible actually many times describes God um, as a rock. Um, and I put three examples, three passages from the Bible on the screen uh, about this. And if we think about a rock, in my lifetime, in your lifetime, a rock doesn't change, does it? It's always the same. It's consistent and unchanging. Even in the face of destructive forces like storms and fire, it remains the same. And the Bible asserts that it's the same with God. He doesn't change. He is consistent. And because of this, we, we can believe in God. We can trust in him. So if we look at these verses, Isaiah 26 verse 4 says, Trust in the Lord forever. Why? For the Lord God is an everlasting rock. The reason we can trust in God is because he is an everlasting rock. He is unchangeable. He is consistent. Uh, Deuteronomy 32 verse 4 says, the rock, speaking about God, his work is perfect for all his ways are just, are just. A God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and upright is he. So God is the rock. He is a God of faithfulness, we're told. Now, the word faithful doesn't mean to be full of faith, but it means to be reliable, to be dependable, to be committed uh, like a faithful spouse is. And then finally, um, Psalm 18 verse 2 says, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. God is not just a rock or the rock, but he can be my rock. That is emphasized that the time and time again, that verse that they, is mine. Um, the God of the Bible is a consistent, reliable, personal source of strength, a rock in whom we can trust. Now, some people think that Christian faith or Christian belief is about blind faith. Um, believing in something where there is no evidence, believing in spite of or even perhaps because of the lack of evidence. Uh, and some other people go even go as far as to suggest that it's about believing in something in the face of strong contradictory evidence. But I want to be really clear that the Bible does not promote the idea of blind faith. If we change the word belief or faith to trust, which is what we are exploring in this video, we can see how foolish this would be. Blind trust, where you trust someone despite the evidence, is incredibly unwise. It will nearly always result in that person getting hurt. Trust needs to be earned. It needs to be demonstrated. Trust relies on evidence of trustworthiness. It requires, uh, as the picture in the bottom corner says, consistency over time. Yeah, that's when it needs to develop trust. We put our trust in people we have a good reason to trust. And the Bible agrees with this. God doesn't want us to just believe uh, and to trust him without any evidence or good reason. In fact, uh, I think this is a major point of the Bible, that it is there to provide us with evidence of who God is and why we can trust him, which is what we're thinking about today, why you can believe in God. So I suggest that faith is not something that makes up for a lack of evidence. The more evidence there is to trust someone, the greater that level of trust. As someone once said, faith is not a leap in the dark. It's the exact opposite. It's a commitment based on evidence. So how does the Bible provide evidence of God's trustworthiness and faithfulness, that he is indeed a rock? Well, there's two um, aspects I've put on the screen there. Uh, the Bible describes God's character um, and then demonstrates his character in how he interacts with mankind. 
And the God of the Bible is, is presented as being consistent. Uh, it doesn't change. Regardless of the circumstances and how people respond, he is consistent and remains the same. And the second aspect is that in the Bible, God makes a number of promises. And God is faithful to these promises and always keeps his promises. So these are two areas that we can use to test the trustworthiness of God. And then there's a quote there from 2 Timothy 2 in the bottom, which says, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. God doesn't change depending on how people treat him. He always is always consistent and reliable to his character. So in, in the book of Exodus, so the second book of the Bible, um, uh, Moses asked God to see his glory. And in response to this, God proclaims his name and his character. And we have that in, in Exodus 34, verse 6 on the screen, which says, The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. These are the characteristics that God ascribes to himself. And it's interesting that, that one of them is faithfulness, that God is reliable, dependable and committed. He can be trusted. Again, though, this isn't blind trust. God explains who he is, but we aren't just expected to believe this with no evidence. The Bible presents then account after account of God demonstrating these characteristics. And in particular, in his relationship with the nation of Israel. Uh, and he is demonstrated to be consistent and not to change, regardless of how people he is dealing with uh, behave. So the Bible is just presents um, evidence that God is consistent and unchanging. Uh, and therefore, we can have confidence that we know what to expect from the God of the Bible, because he has proved to be consistent and faithful to his character. And we can therefore trust in God. And these characteristics that, that God has described to himself, uh, I think it's important to note that it doesn't mean that God is a pushover. Because the next verse goes on to say, um, uh, verse 7 uh, of Exodus 34, goes on to say that God is abundantly merciful and forgiving. But he will also execute consequences and punishment on those who continue to do wrong. So God is a just God and he is consistently so. So God is shown um, particularly, I think, to be trustworthy in faith in the Bible because he always keeps his promises. God makes a number of promises in the Bible, uh, and these are called covenants. A covenant is an agreement that God makes with a person or a group of people with whom he is forming a partnership. Uh, and God makes promises and he asks those that he is partnering, partnering with um, to fulfill certain commitments. So it's a two way uh, agreement. And I'd like us to look at a few examples of these to demonstrate the trustworthiness of God. And we're going to start right at the start of the Bible in Genesis chapter one. So if you've got a Bible, please, please turn with me to Genesis one. Um, and we're going to look at uh, verse 26 to 28. Uh, these are verses about the creation of, of mankind, of man and woman. So I'm going to read Genesis one and verse 26 to 28. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth so god created man in his own image in the image of god created he him male and female created he them and god blessed them and god said unto them be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth so I think these verses provide um, insight into God's plan and intention for mankind. Humans, we're told, are made in his image. So we are to reflect his character, the character that we've just been considering uh, merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Um, humans are to reflect that they are to be the image of God. Um, humans were also to have also to have dominion and to subdue creation. So God had created mankind with the intention of partnering with them, that we are to rule on God's behalf over his creation um, with his characteristics. 
If you move on then to Genesis 2, and I'll look at the, I'll read verse 15 to 17. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So we told it that man is placed in a garden to care for it and to protect it. Uh, and God then gives a command not to eat of a certain tree, or the consequences will be mortality. Uh, God is establishing a covenant. This is a partnership based on promises requiring certain commitments. What happens though, we read in, in chapter 3 and verse 6, uh, which says, and when the woman saw that the tree, and this is the tree spoken of in, in chapter 2, we just read about the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. When she saw that the tree was good for food, and it was pleasant to the eyes, a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and also gave unto her husband with her, and he did eat. What happens is that humans fail to uphold their side of the agreement. Um, and they, they break the, the one command that God had given them, the one commitment he was asking them to make. And we see that the weakest link in the covenant or the partnership between God and humans is the humans. God is consistent, of course, and he proves himself faithful to his word. And the humans therefore experience mortality and death. Uh, and we find that this is a consistent theme in the Bible. God is desiring to enter into a covenant relationship with humans to partner with them he's always consistent and he keeps his promises but it's the humans who are consistently the weakest link uh, if we move on through genesis the next few chapters in genesis record the continuation of, of a downward spiral so we've got a downward spiral on the screen from adam and eve so chapter four we have cain murdering his brother abel chapter six we have the wickedness of mankind their thoughts were only evil all the time which was obviously the flood chapter 11 the tower of babel where people trying to reach heaven and make a name for themselves just trying to exalt themselves um, th th this then um, brings us to, to chapter 12, uh, where we are introduced to a man called Abraham, whose name is later changed to Abraham. Uh, and God makes another covenant. And we read in, in Genesis 12, verse 3, part of that covenant, God says, In thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So God promises that through Abraham, all people of the earth will be blessed. Uh, and I just want us to note this for now. We know promises, and what we will see is that this is no exception. That God will keep this promise. That that through uh, Abraham, and particularly through his, his, his descendants, there'll be blessing brought to all nations. If we turn though to um, Exodus 19, so the second book of the Bible, um, what happens um, uh, after Abraham is, is that his descendants. Uh, later go down to Egypt. They are enslaved by the Egyptians. God brings them out through Moses um, um, in the book of Exodus. Uh, and then God makes a covenant with the children of Israel. So that's with Abraham's descendants at Mount Sinai. So here we have God making a covenant. And we read in Exodus 19, verse 5 and 6 this. God says, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant. So God is making a partnership agreement, a covenant with uh, the nation of Israel, the children of Israel. Then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So through this covenant, Israel was to be a special people if they kept God's covenant. It was a partnership similar to that with Adam and Eve. It, um, Israel was to fulfill in many ways the purpose which God had made mankind. They were to be a kingdom of priests, revealing to the world, uh, revealing God, sorry, to the world around them. They were to be the image of God as Adam and Eve were made to be. But the Bible records that just like Adam and Eve, the humans failed to keep their side of the covenant and they slowly spiral downwards. Um, and again, we see um, that, that despite this, God is consistent. Uh, and it uh, it is the human beings, in this case, the nation of Israel, uh, uh, that is the weakest link in the relationship. But God doesn't give up or doesn't doesn't change. He's trustworthy. He's consistent. He's dependable. 
Um, and later on, um, in uh, some of the, the, the prophets, um, the covenant partnership relationship between God and Israel is compared, interestingly, to a marriage. So a marriage is a relationship which is based on promises, is a covenant relationship. And God is presented as the faithful spouse and Israel as unfaithful. Uh, and I'll read some verses that kind of illustrate this. So in Hosea 3 verse 1, uh, we're told, we're sold. Then the Lord said to me, go again, love a woman who is loved by a lover and is committing adultery. Just like the love of the Lord for the children of Israel, who look to other gods and love the raising cakes of the pagans. Um, so here we're told that, that God's relationship with Israel is, is like a marriage uh, where the wife is adulterous and unfaithful. Uh, in Hosea 6 uh, verse 7 we read, But like men, they transgress the covenant. They, there they dealt treacherously with me, is God speaking. And the word men there is the word Adam. So we, we could see the comparison here with, with Adam. Israel broke their covenant with God, just like Adam and Eve. God remained faithful to his promises, just like a faithful spouse. But Israel behaved like an adulterous wife. Similarly, in Jeremiah 3, uh, in verse 20, we read, um, God saying, surely as a wife treacherously departs from my husband, so have you dealt treacherously with me. O house of Israel, says the Lord. The nation of Israel had been unfaithful and committed adultery to, uh, with that relationship with God, but God remains faithful. And then we read in, in Jeremiah 3, verse 12, so 14, um, God says, return backsliding Israel, says the Lord. I will not cause my anger to fall on you, for I am merciful, says the Lord. I will not remain angry forever. Only acknowledge your iniquity that you have transgressed against the Lord your God and have scattered your charms to alien deities under every green tree. And you have not obeyed my voice, says the Lord. Return, O backside and children, says the Lord, for I am married to you. So we see here again the analogy of that covenant relationship is like a marriage. God remains faithful to his covenant commitment like, like a faithful spouse does. Israel has been faithless, it's described as backsliding in that verse, but God wants them to return. Note again that God is not a pushover. He remains consistent to his standards and he requires Israel to acknowledge that he have transgressed the covenant. But if they do this, then God is merciful. This is again further evidence of the consistent and trustworthy nature of God's character. It's that, that same character we read about in Exodus 34, that he is a merciful God. So going through those verses, the point of that was really to demonstrate that we've seen time and time again that God wants to partner with humanity through covenant relationships. Um, God always remains consistent and unchanging, and it is us humans who are the weak link in the covenant relationship with God. Um, an analogy which might, might, might help to illustrate this is to think about the covenant between God and mankind uh, as a bridge. So the covenant between um, God and mankind can be thought of as a bridge. God is on one side and we are on the other and there is, there is a void between us. But this bridge has two parts. Uh, the covenant has two parts which then meet in the middle. God extends his promises. That's his side of the covenant. But he also asks those who are partnering with him to fulfill certain commitments. So there is another side to the, to the to covenant. And, and this now, what I suggest is that God's half of the bridge it's like the bridge um, uh, on the right. It's sure and unchanging and dependable. However, our half of the bridge, our half of the covenant, looks like the bridge on the left. Weak, fragile, prone to breaking. We are the weak point in this covenant relationship. Um, and we can imagine these two bridges extending across a river and meeting in the middle. And I would have complete confidence in God's side of the bridge, but humanity's side is just not trustworthy. Uh, and the problem, so the problem is not with God. He is consistent. He is trustworthy. The problem we see is with us. But the Bible teaches that God doesn't give up. He continues to remain faithful and he provides a way. And that way is Jesus. So God fulfills his promises through Jesus. 
We read in Colossians 1 verse 15 that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Jesus fulfills the purpose which mankind was made to be the image of God, to reflect God's character. Galatians 3 verse 8 says, And scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles, Gentiles are, are, are non-Israelites, non-Jews, would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, in you all nations shall be blessed. So this is quoting the promise that we, we read uh, in Genesis 12 uh, that God made to Abraham. And here in this verse, in the New Testament, it, this is being described as the gospel, the good news, um, uh, that um, all nations would be blessed through Abraham, including uh, the, the Gentiles, not just the Jews, not just the Israelites, but be for all nations. How would this happen? Well, in verse 14 of Galatians 3, you read that the blessing of Abraham might come unto the Gentiles in Christ Jesus. It's through Jesus, who was a descendant or a seed of Abraham, uh, that, that God fulfills his promise to bring blessings to all people and nations. And then we have Hebrews 9. Um, verse 11 says that, that Christ is the high priest of good things to come. Verse 15 says that he is the mediator of a new covenant. So Jesus is the great high priest establishing a new covenant. He is fulfilling Israel's role, which was to be a kingdom of priests, to, to reveal God to the world. So we see, I think, that God is, is faithful to his promises and he doesn't give up. Despite the failings of mankind, God provides a way to fulfill his promises through Jesus. We then come to Revelation 5. This is, uh, I want us to think about this verse here. Revelation 5 um, provides a vision of, of the resurrected Jesus, the, the lamb looking like it had been slain in reference to his, his, his sacri sacrifice. What had Jesus achieved for us? We read in Revelation 5 verse 10, uh, it says, and you, so Jesus, have made them. Who's the them? Well, the them uh, in the previous verse, in verse nine, is people of every tribe, language and nation. This is the fulfillment of the promise to Abraham, the blessing to all nations. You have made them, people of every nation and tribe and language, uh, a kingdom and priests to our God. And they shall reign, where? On the earth. Again, God is consistent. His intention from the start was to partner with mankind, for mankind to rule on God's behalf over his creation. For mankind to be his image, to be priests, revealing God to the world. And what we see um, is that when humans prove themselves to be unfaithful, unfaithful, when they are that, that rickety bridge that keeps breaking, God doesn't give up and choose to do something else. He remains consistent to his character and to his promises. And he provides another way through Jesus. The Bible says that we are waiting for Jesus to return from heaven to earth, to establish God's kingdom on earth. Then God will ultimately fulfill his intention for this world. God will partner with those who are in Christ, who will reign on the earth. The biblical hope is not that we go to heaven when we die. Instead, it is that we are waiting for the return of Jesus and the establishment of God's kingdom on the earth. So we've been exploring reasons that we can have trust and confidence in the God of the Bible. Um, we are not asked to have blind faith or blind trust, but instead to consider the evidence of God's trustworthiness. And what I hope to have shown is that the Bible provides good evidence for us to put our trust in God. It demonstrates that God is consistent to his character and to his promises that he made. He is a rock. He is stable. He is reliable. He is trustworthy. He is predictable. God is consistent and doesn't change regardless of what happens. Even when those uh, who God has partnered with are unfaithful, God remains committed and doesn't change. We consider that we are the weakest link in that covenant bridge. Uh, but even then, God has provided a way through uh, way through Jesus. Uh, the God of the Bible doesn't give up. Uh, and when Jesus returns, God's kingdom will be established on the earth and all of God's promises will ultimately be fulfilled. And if you want to be part of this, then we need to do what God asked Israel to do in Jeremiah 3. 
to return to him, to acknowledge our wrongdoing. Uh, and God will grant us mercy uh, as he promised to Israel. So in summary, I suggest that we we can believe in God, meaning to to trust and to have confidence in God, because the Bible pr provides evidence that he is all of these things on the screen, that he is trustworthy, that he is reliable, that he is stable and he is consistent and dependable and faithful and he is capable. And for these reasons, I'm convinced that the God of the Bible is a God that I can trust. Thank you.